Hey guys, welcome back to my videos. Uh, we're gonna start something pretty cool and new, a uh, new video series. It's gonna be quite long, uh, who knows, a couple of years maybe, but what we're going to be doing is we are going to be building the Lost in Space B9 full-size replica robot, uh, fully functional, and I've started on this kind of project and I've created this robot lab, so you can see here's a sign here. Here's my lab, which I've kind of set up here. It's quite a mess right now. Um, I've got my 3D printer here. I'm working on a, a model right now of the Jupiter 2. I got all kinds of things on the middle of construction of here. Got tons of parts all over the place, just uh, packed everywhere. And then uh, let's jump into the other room here. This is actually my Lost in Space collection over here. But um, let's jump into the other room. I'll show you some other stuff. So I've got a room of parts over here also. You know, we've got uh, all kinds of stuff um, in different stages of build here for the robot. And then let's jump to the other room. So down here in the main floor, I've got the uh, actual tread sections for the robot. So we've got all kinds of parts all over the house. Just craziness right now. Um, trying to get a little better organized, but uh, what we're going to do is I want to show you what we're going to actually be building uh, with a two-foot model of the Lost in Space B9 robot. All right, so let's start with a quick blueprint of the robot itself. So if you're familiar with the series Lost in Space from the 60s, basically um, they had a main character, which was this robot. Now this robot had a guy inside of it that actually did all the movements for the most part. We have to create a robot that's actually going to do all these movements by itself, mechanically. So um, our main layout for the robot is really broken into uh, kind of four main sections. So you have the tread section at the bottom here. This obviously was the section where the treads moved and actually gave the mobility to the robot. We have the leg section in the middle, which was kind of a rubberized section uh, that could move. He could bend over. Um, in the series, sometime on some of the episodes, the, the treads would actually split in the middle and they could, he could actually walk with like almost like two legs. Uh, that's kind of impossible in our design, so our tread section is just going to, you know, move forward, backwards, left, right, etc. But it won't split. Uh, but we are going to try to make it bend at the waist, uh, which is one of the f big sort of like things in Lost in Space where Dr. Smith would get mad at the robot, pull the power pack, and then he would his arms would fall out and he'd be, sort of bend over because uh, he was de-energized. But that'll be inside this middle section right here. The next section is the torso section, which is the main body at the top here where it has all the lights and the voice um, panel right here, right? You got the arms and everything that goes in that section. And then we have what they call the head section, which is from the collar on up. Uh, which is kind of where the robot would be looking out from in his in his brain where he had the eyes and stuff like that So that's the basic layout of the robot. So let's go over to the two-foot model and, and take a look at it All right, so this is a two-foot uh, model of the robot. This was made by Trend Masters It came out like uh, around the time that the Lost in Space movie remake came out in the late 90s um, it's kind of cool. It's a fully on a functioning remote control robot. You have a little remote control that goes with it, moves it around, has sound and lights and all that kind of stuff. But we're going to use it as our example here of what we need to do. So uh, the first is, again, these tread sections at the bottom right here, right? So a couple of things happen in the tread section. So obviously this is what powers the robot to move forward and back, left and right. It also has this thing called a soil sampler inside of here, which we are going to have a fully functional soil sampler. On the little plastic model, it's just a pic picture they have inside here. But basically, and the, the door is actually upside down, it would be pivoting at the top here. But basically, um, what happens is in like one of the first episodes of Lost in Space, they showed where the robot went out into the planet that they had landed on and was doing environmental tests and one of them was a soil sampler where this little door sort of opened up and then this little uh, drill sort of came out that would drill into the ground take a soil sampler and go back in so we're gonna have that fully functional soil sampler so that'll be part of the main tread section the other thing we're gonna have is a movable tread section so he'll be able to move forward back left and right with a remote control 
and the treads here, um, hopefully we can get these to move along with it. These will not be driving the tread section. It would be driven by actually motors and wheels underneath the tread section because these belts are not strong enough to pull, you know, two to 300 pounds without tearing and stretching. But um, hopefully we can either uh, have a little bit of friction where it'll drag them and move them or we can power them with a motor internally to make them move when the, the tread section moves so it looks like they're actually driving it. So that'll be our main portion in the tread section. Motorizing it, uh, getting control over it wirelessly, getting the soil sampler done, and then um, obviously uh, this is where the uh, battery is going to be stored too because uh, we can't have it plugged into a wire or a cord when we're trying to do it remotely and have it move around. So. That will all be stored sort of in this bottom section right here. Uh, the next section we have to worry about is this middle part right here, which is the leg section. So these are considered the knees at the bottom here, and then the legs are here. Um, this is rubber, uh, so this will be a flexible material in here with a support system inside of it. And then one of the key things that we want to do, um, which it's not going to be easy, but we I think we'll be able to do it, is the bend. So basically the robot in the series would bend over when the power pack was pulled to indicate that you know he was deactivated basically. It doesn't have to be a severe bend, it can just be a slight bend over but he needs to look like he's sort of slumped over on the front uh, when we do that. So that'll require that the frame inside here that supports this plate right here which is called the waist plate um, that frame actually has a pivot to it and then we're going to use some kind of actuator or, or um, linear servo or something like that to make it go up and down for that uh, movement. Since this is all rubber, all these legs are rubber, that's totally flexible so that's not an actual issue. So we should be okay there. But that will be one of the key components to getting that done. And then this will be controlled by um, either Arduino uh, boards or the Easy Robot system, which I also have. And I may have a combination of both Easy Robot and Arduino inside here. The nice thing about Arduino is you pretty much can do whatever you want with it. Um, it's a very flexible system, so um, that's what we're going to do inside of here. Then we have this main uh, torso section right here. So there's a lot going on in this section. So obviously um, you're going to have what we call the programming bay underneath here. This slides open and there's switches and lights and, and buttons inside of here. The main piece right here has uh, lights that blink and then these are push uh, buttons that blink also. Normally these are just solidly lit and a lot of the replicas I've seen they are just uh, lit buttons. They don't do anything. They're not functional. We're gonna make these all uh, 10 of these buttons uh, functional, which means when you push it, it's actually going to trigger some kind of sequence, whether it's just a voice command or some kind of like motion sequence or whatever it is. So this is going to be a little more work in here to get these functional, but we're going to make all these buttons functional. And then it has the two chest lights, which just sort of blink back and forth as alternating uh, lights. Um, this is the microphone um, here. We're going to actually make this a, an operating microphone where we will be able to use voice uh, commands to tell it what to do. So this is where it'll kind of pick that up. And then this is a this is a knob, a rotary knob here that you can use for different things. I'm not sure what we'll use it for yet. Uh, a lot of people use it for volume control, like if you want to change the volume, maybe the, the background, mechanical sounds, or the actual voice itself. So. We'll figure out what we want to do there, but that is an operational um, volume or a potentiometer that we're going to put behind here to do some kind of control on something. I'm not sure what it's going to be yet. The uh, voice uh, portion right here, this will be uh, neon, uh, electrical neon, just like a neon sign, uh, tubes and then it will flash in sequence to the voice clips that we're going to you know pass through the robot through either the easy robot or the Arduino boards uh, to command to tell it what to do and say. 
And so as it spe as he speaks, it'll be the, the clips from the series, right? The voice clips, and then the flashing will be in, synchroni in synchronization with that, those voice clips. The arms are going to be the biggest challenge of the entire project, I would think. Um, we could just make them static arms where they just sort of sit there. Um, but what we're going to do is these are going to be as fully functional as we can make them. So on these plastic models, they always come out at a weird angle here, which doesn't make any sense because the robot's arms came straight out. But what we want to have happen is uh, there'll be a, a, a robotic arm in here that's basically going to come straight out and also be able to uh, sort of go up and down. So, you know, he, one of his most famous things is the warning, warning, danger, Will Robinson. And so when that happens, his arms sort of bend at the uh, elbows and he's sort of wailing up and down both sides, waving his arms, right? So that's one thing we'd like to accomplish. I don't want to get too crazy with the arms. Um, this is super complicated mechanics that are going to have to be in here to make this work. Um, I really just want them to come out quickly, go in quickly, and then be able to uh, sort of wave up and down. Um, and then maybe when he bends over, we can get them to fall out too. Um, that would be the third sequence. But this is probably going to be the piece that takes the longest amount of time. The other thing is the claws themselves. These are going to be operational also, so they will open and close. Uh, so they'll open and close and sort of like pinch. Um, I already have the system from one of the vendors that has all the gearing and everything for this. So this is pretty much pretty easy. I don't really have to create anything for this. This is sort of uh, ready to go. I just have to put it together, put the servos in and, and then get those controlled by the Easy Robot or the Arduino boards, one of the two. But this whole this whole thing right here with the arms is going to be the most complicated portion of it. No, no question about it. Um, uh, let's see what else. Uh, so then we get up to the actual head section right here. So when you get to the head section um, You've got a couple things going on We've got this uh, thing here. This is called the collar So in the TV show, this is where the guy inside actually looked through to see out so to see where he was going um, Bob May when he was inside the robot. So this will be uh, Same collar. It'll look ident identical to the uh, TV series and then this is called the radar section at the top here. So this section actually moves left and right. Um, so this indicates some kind of a action or expression by the robot when it moves left and right. And when it moves left and right, everything from here on up moves with it left and right. So um, in the model right here, unfortunately, it's not really uh, correct, uh, but basically uh, the front of the brain, this portion inside here, right, would be facing forward because on the front part of the brain there's two eyes on each end of this, uh, like right here and right here, there'd be two eyes and those would always face forward or they'd be facing the direction that his head is turning. So you consider this part on up the head of the robot and as it turned left and right, basically, his eyes would be pointing left or right or wherever he was looking at the time. And all this turns with it. So the eyes would always be lined up with the two sensors right here. These two sensors will be spinning around just like they did on, I think, the first or second episode. Uh, they stopped actually all this movement in the top head of the robot because it was so noisy and the actor couldn't hear. Uh, Coming, different uh, cues and stuff like that. So you only see this operational in the very couple of first episodes of Lost in Space. After that, they just turned them off and they were static all the time. But we're going to make these fully functional so they'll be spinning around. Um, and then inside here, there's also these things called the finger lights, uh, which you kind of can see them inside there. These, these little lights that are sticking out of these little finger rods. So those lights uh, alternately went up and down. So as one went down, the one next to it went up and down and up. So they were just sort of bobbing up and down inside there. So that'll be fully functional too. We'll have that working. And those lights inside there are blinking at the same time that they're moving up and down. And then uh, this portion right here, this triangular portion is called the brain. 
and there was again not they don't have it on the model here but on the sides of the brain there were hieroglyphics cut into that and inside were blinking lights that made this whole thing sort of blink um, <clears throat> while it was operational so we'll have that and then this top part is called the crown which is just this uh, disc that spins around um, and that will be fully functional too. The robot actually did not have this single light like they have in the uh, toy here. It actually had three lights on the brain here, kind of where these little dots are right here. Those were three blinking lights, but it didn't have one in the center of the crown right there. The crown was just by itself and it just spent, spun around. And um, otherwise, everything else will be the same as far as the sides go here. There'll be vents on the sides and the back, just like there were on the real robot. The other thing is, uh, over here, which they don't have on the toy, there would be a power pack right about here. And so we will have a power pack right here. And that will be a fully functioning power pack so that when we pull it out, uh, the robot's power will go off and he'll power down. And the same thing when we plug it back in. There's a pretty famous uh, series of voice clips that go with that, uh, that the robot says every time they kind of do that. There's like an arg uh, when you pull out the pack and then there's a sequence where he says, who turned out the lights uh, when you plug it back in type of thing. So we'll have all that stuff functioning. What's nice about the uh, Easy Robot and the Arduino systems is they're pretty easy to program a bunch of scripts based on something that happens in the robot. So for instance, on the power pack here, it'll just be either a ground connection or a, a losing a ground or however we're going to do it. But when it sees that signal going across to the, the board, uh, then it'll trigger a series of events like powering everything down uh, and maybe triggering a voice clip or something like that. So, so that's kind of the, the main pieces of the robot and what we're after. Now, we pretty much have most of the parts we need. We have a couple of them on, on order. Uh, I belong to this club called the B9 Robot Builders Club. And it's kind of like a co-op where a lot of the members of the club each individually make different pieces or parts. Um, now, it's a hobby for them. They only make them every so often. So sometimes you can wait a couple of years till you can get something. Um, I've been lucky to be able to get a lot of the stuff and I actually bought a, a robot off a guy that uh, didn't want to finish the project. So I have a lot of uh, parts sitting here waiting. But the main thing is I did get a set of treads here. Now I have another set on actually order. Um, and I actually may build two different robots because um, if you're familiar with the series, there were a couple versions of the robot. This is the standard version. Uh, there was a one special one called the Antimatter one in the Antimatter Man uh, episode. Um, and then there was also one called Golden Boy where um, there was another episode where the robot would turn completely gold. So I might end up building two full-size robots, but regardless, uh, this is kind of where we're going to start with. And so there's a lot of things happening in the background before I can actually physically start building things. Um, I'm learning Arduino in the background. I've got a like a course I'm taking uh, for programming. I've got the easy robot stuff. There's a lot of like playing around with the electronics and everything because that is really what's going to make him come to life. You could build a static model of him full size and that's great, but it won't be very exciting if he's just standing there doing nothing. Um, the key is to make him fully animated and um, as close to the you know real thing as, as if there was a guy inside of him controlling him. But we'll see how far we get. We got a lot of stuff going on. You can see I'm building this Jupiter 2 diorama here. Um, and there's always something going on that I'm trying, but um, I'm waiting for some parts right now uh, to come in so I can start on the uh, tread sections first. So that is where we're going to start. We are building different pieces simultaneously. So while I'm waiting for parts, you can see this is the first uh, build of the collar, right? This is the main structure of it here. So we're building different types of things in the meantime, but uh, our main goal is going to be to start at the bottom with the treads and work our way up. Um, so our main 
control system that I've decided to use for the bottom portion at least with the tread sections is I'm going to use the Padawan 360 system. So obviously Padawan is a term from Star Wars, uh, but it's a system that uh, somebody developed um, that uses the Xbox wireless uh, video game uh, controller. Uh, and then it uses Arduino to control different functions. So basically I'm going to be able to use a wireless Xbox controller to move the robot forward, back, left, and right in his tread sections, right? And then it'll have other things like I can trigger sounds with it and do different things with it. Uh, so I've decided to use that instead of a standard RC controller, which was I, I was originally going to use. But I like the Xbox uh, one better. It's really uh, kind of simple and quick to hook up to an Arduino with a USB shield and then um, it it has enough button combinations on it where you're going to be able to do a lot of things to control the robot. Um, there's still maybe other stuff that I'll control with the chest buttons here and everything but um, I think for the most part I'll be able to get a lot out of the uh, Xbox controller to do what I want. Um, you've got four buttons on the Xbox controller and two top buttons that can then make even more combinations when you hold those down. So um, I think it's gonna be uh, really good. I'm waiting for some parts to come in, uh, some Arduino boards, uh, the controller, and my next video is gonna be on the actual electronics setup for the tread section. The actual movement of the tread section is really just gonna be about putting motors inside here with wheels. And that's not like as big a, like, uh, mystery, right? It's just you get motors, you get wheels, you try to find the right sizes you want and get it all mounted in there. But once you do that, you got to have a way to control this. And that's what I'm going to do on my next video coming up. And that video is going to show you how am I going to wire this Xbox controller with the Arduino boards. And then I'm going to have two motors on the bench here just so you can see how it works. They may not be the motors I use, but they're going to be motors that I'm going to control and show you how I'm going to control the treads. So uh, before I end this video, let's go downstairs and look at the treads for a section and see what we're going to have to do down there. Oh, I forgot one one extra movement, which is like one of the key movements. You see it all the time in the series, um, which is the bubble. It's called the bubble lift. And so that's where the, the robot would like, you know, if he was surprised or alerted, go like, ah. Uh, or if he was sad, his double bubble would go down, right? It's another motion on the robot that indicates some kind of a, uh, emotion, you know, that he's feeling based on, you know, where he's happy, alerted, scared, whatever it may be. So this up and down bubble motion, uh, we will also be doing on the robot. So that's another mechanical motion that we'll have to, uh, again, do more mechanics on the inside to get it to go up and down. But... Um, we'll have that. So I think that covers all the motions now. Uh, sorry, I missed that one initially when I was doing my little demo here on this uh, model. Um, oh, sorry, I am missing another one. Um, so we are going to be doing the waist rotation. Now, um, this one is, you can see here, he moves back and forth, right? So the waist rotation is another movement on the robot, and um, we'll be able to do that too. There's a gear and a motor that will go down in here uh, to make him rotate uh, left and right. Um, so that'll be another motion that we'll be doing. So a lot of mechanics on the inside of the robot, but um, I think we've got it all sort of mapped out and worked out. So hopefully it'll all um, really uh, turn out to be uh, really cool when you actually see it working. Okay, so here's our tread section. So this is made out of uh, aluminum. Um, so even though it's made out of aluminum, this is still a heavy, heavy tread section. We've got these aluminum uh, wheels, and there's 32 of them on the B9 robot. And between the wheels, the tread sections, and then these heavy rubber uh, tread belts, right? This thing weighs a lot. And we don't even have anything above it yet, right? This is just the base tread section so far. But, what we need to do here is inside the tread section, you can see we have this space right here. This is where we have to mount the motor and the wheel. So, 
Um, I'm still researching the different motors and wheels I want to use. I got to make sure that I have enough power and torque to be able to move this thing because it's going to be probably like mm, two to three hundred pounds when you're talking about the entire thing put together. So, um, but we we need to mount it obviously in this section here. Now we have some, we got a plate here, we got a plate on this side, we got some uh, bars on the top here. So we'll have to figure out some kind of a bracket system, right? And it probably should be adjustable so that we can mount it and move the wheel up and down. But basically what has to happen is our drive wheel or tire is gonna have to come down here and it's gonna have to be just below the bottom of the where the tread would normally hit on the ground so that it lifts the robot just a hair off the ground and it's being driven by these, uh, these um, drive tires and motors. And then somehow in the front here, we're gonna have to put some kind of a swivel caster or something so that um, it can support that side, right, to keep it level, but then also be able to move uh, based on what the drive wheels do. Now on the other side, we got tons of room, but on this side, we do have a little bit of an issue because we have this thing right here. So this is the unit um, which is called the soil sampler that I was referring to upstairs. So um, basically what happens is, as I said, this little door will open up right here and when that happens, it will, the soil sampler here will start spinning round and round and then protrude out into the ground to take a soil sample. So um, this was made by, um, this was designed actually by Mike Joyce at B9 Creations when they did the, some of the full size replicas of the robots. Um, uh, but Another of the club members started making these after that was discontinued, and these are hard to get. Um, they're not being produced right now, so just having the soil sampler at all is a big coup because otherwise I'd have to make it myself. And um, even though it's not super complicated, it you know it's all been uh, obviously worked out where um, they have it so the uh, the mechanism automatically will come in and out just by grounding it two wires together so um, oops sorry I accidentally zoomed it uh, so but because of this right and we don't want to lose this um, we do have a limited amount of space in the back here so we have to get the right size wheel and we have to be able to mount this motor while still keeping this in here now luckily we do have a lot of space vertically to work with so as far as brackets and everything else uh, we should have enough room, I, I'm thinking. Uh, the only thing is uh, we may have to have some custom brackets made. I'm not sure, depending if I can get any off-the-shelf stuff or um, if I need to go to a machine shop and have some custom brackets made to get this motor in here. Um, uh, this is the tread section I bought off of one of the guys in the club, so he had already started to assemble it and everything. I'm going to have to take this all apart. Um, uh, it got chipped in uh, when I was bringing it out from uh, Arizona, and so we, it needs a new paint job too on top of that. And then uh, um, we need to get all this these tread beds belt, belts out and these wheels so we can make this lighter and then work on this a little easier to get the, um, the actual motor drivers in. But as I said before, our first step is to get the uh, electronic control portion uh, designed and built and tested and then putting the motors in is sort of a secondary thing which is just sort of a mechanical thing um, and then once they're in there then we can hook it all up and what I hope to show you guys is this tread section being moved around by itself with an Xbox wireless controller and um, then that would be fantastic my my big deal is that um, trying to figure out what size motor to put in here and the number of um, um, volts and, and watts. So I'm thinking these will have to be 24 volt motors with at least two to 300 watts in order to get the torque that I need. Um, but you know, we may have to um, experiment and then possibly, if they're too weak, uh, get bigger, stronger motors. But the nice part about it is it's just going to be a simple DC brushed motor. I'm not going to do, use anything special where I have to do two or, th I mean, three phase motors and things like that. 
I'm just going to use regular uh, DC brushed motors with a motor controller and that will um, allow me to just swap them out if for some reason I get ones that are too weak and they're just not doing it or after I start loading on more weight onto the robot I find that it's not moving uh, or it's you know stalling when it shouldn't be so it'll be an experiment and that's one of the things when you're building these robots um, if you're not an electrical you know engineer and uh, you don't really understand some of all these specifications you have to sort of experiment with it where you're going to have to take your best guess uh, and then put it in see if it works and if not you have to try a different one and so it does cost some money because you're you know you're wasting money on things that you may or may not use but I think as far as the control system I, I think I got the design down so um, Hopefully next week we'll be getting our stuff and next Saturday I'm hoping to be able to assemble the electronics portion of the drive system and give it a test run and, and see what it looks like. So stay tuned. Um, this is going to be a long video series um, but this uh, I think will be one of the coolest ones that um, I've worked on. This is a pretty, pretty fun project and um, the end result I think is going to be uh, spectacular so stay tuned.